Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Joshua Tepper. Uh, Dr. Tepper is a family physician uh, who's Vice President of Education at Sunnybrook Health Sciences, Health Sciences Centre Ontario and a member of the Sunnybrook Family Practice Team. Uh, Dr. Tepper is also an Assistant Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, which is the Government of Ontario Ministry responsible for administering the healthcare system uh, and providing services to the people of the province of Ontario. Uh, with a degree in public policy from Duke University and a Masters of Public Health from Harvard University, uh, he has been involved in health policy and research relating to health human resources at both the provincial and national level. Uh, he was a senior medical officer for Health Canada, uh, an adjunct scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, and a research consultant for the Canadian Institute of Health Information. Uh, Joshua currently co-chairs the Physician Services Committee, a joint committee between the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and the Ontario Medical Association. Uh, he's also a member of the Joint Provincial Nursing Committee. Uh, please welcome Joshua Tepper. Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and, and for the invitation today. Uh, this is a tremendous honor uh, to be invited. It's, it's a wonderful forum uh, and a wonderful sort of public engagement that you have here. And, and also just a privilege actually to, to serve on this panel with Dr. Bevan, uh, just an unbelievable leader uh, who I've known by reputation for a long time. And I got to go around for weeks saying, I'm gonna go be on a panel with Dr. Bevan. It was like going to meet with a rock star. So uh, uh, it really is a, a, a real honor. Um, just a, a few uh, things uh, off the top. First of all, uh, despite uh, that, that very nice bio, today I, I'm just here as me. I'm not representing everybody or anybody, and uh, so if you don't like it, you, you can't call anybody back in Canada and say, what the heck? Um, and uh, also, what I'm talking about is often examples of excellence. I don't want you to leave and thinking, boy, Canada's really got it figured out. The UK might, we don't. I'm talking about a few leading examples that hope, hopefully, will become the normative standard of how we do things in HHR, but we're not there yet. And I tried to make this national, but I, you, know, you, you know your own backyard best, right? And so these are a little bit Ontario-based. That way, if you ask me hard questions, I probably was responsible for bringing the change in, and I might have a chance of answering them. Um, also, we, we sort of chatted earlier. Dr. Bevan wanted to take the really hard questions, and I was comfortable with that. So I just want to <laughs> set that up front. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, uh, some challenges that we have. I want to talk about some of the solutions we've done, and I want to end with the gaps that still remain about where we still need to strive for. But before we get there, time for a little pop quiz. Uh, I know you thought you'd just be able to hang back there. No, 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 no. Pop quiz. So, by show of hands, Canada has a larger landmass than Australia. True, false, I thought this was a wine and cheese event. Why are you talking at me? <laughs> All right, how many think it's true? Canada has a larger landmass. Yeah, you know the truth. It is true. We do have a larger land mass, equally sparsely populated. Uh, it's me, you, and Mongolia in terms of large land masses with not very many people. Number two, the Prime Minister of Canada is Jean Chrétien, George Bush, Stephen Harper, Michael J. Fox. One, who says Jean Chrétien? Raise your hands. George Bush. He just thought he was, but we said no. Uh, Stephen Harper. All right. And Michael J. Fox. We desperately, we were hoping he would. Um, uh, he declined. Um, it is uh, Stephen Harper, Jean Chrétien at one point was our Prime Minister. And finally, and most relevantly, Canada's healthcare system is a uniform national single-payer system, a national system with an optional private sector for those who wish, a series of regional single-payer systems guided by national principles, a national system for those unemployed, otherwise through employer, or bankrupt. Um, so, Number five is absolutely correct, but you may also vote on the first four. How many say number one, national single-payer system? National system with an optional private sector? A few of you, you should be chatting to Bev, uh, Helen Bevan. A series of regional single-payer systems guided by national principles? That would be correct. And so we have more and more heterogeneity across the system. 
Uh, this is a picture of one of the communities I worked in in the most northern parts uh, in the Inuit. Uh, it looks very different from the beautiful beach I jogged along at the end of your tram system this morning. Um, this was July. Um, actually, it was about March. Uh, but it looks like this in July, uh, which would be your December, if I've done this right. Uh, so the problem with our healthcare system is a little danger ahead for us, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because the challenges we have are the same that Helen talked about, are the same that you talk about and read about on the front pages of your paper every day. We have an increasingly aging workforce, this laser pointer almost works, uh, and an increasingly aging population. As people get old, they still use the majority of their health care, about 80, 90 percent within the last six months of life. Women, it's a little bit lower, but it's still above 90 percent. Uh, for a bunch of reasons, not just aging, chronic diseases going up. Uh, you can't read that, that's intentional. Uh, but that is the incident rate of uh, diabetes. And so chronic disease is coming up, and so from a health workforce perspective, having people with the skill sets is changing. Uh, these are intended to be international uh, foreign workers. Uh, basically, within five years, all new growth to our workforce outside of healthcare will be through immigration. And our, the internationally educated component of our workforce is steadily climbing. We have a large, well, not a large Aboriginal population, about 4.5%, but I would say that their health outcomes, by almost any measure, are among the worst in the world. I mean, we are up there with sort of Africa and others. Our Aboriginal populations do not have the privilege and benefits of the rest of Canada in terms of a health care system that meets their needs in a robust way. It's a tremendous embarrassment. This is a little uh, slide about the budget costs in Ontario, and what you can see is over a period of a few decades, a rate of slope. Uh, that is absolutely uh, exceptional. We are blowing through our, you know, we are now 50 cents on every dollar goes to healthcare. We are easily on target within about five to eight years of being of 70 cents of every single dollar going to healthcare. 70 cents, that means 30 cents for everything else that the government supports in society. Everything else, it is a staggering fact. And we have been desperately hit by the economic turndown, uh, particularly in Ontario, but other parts of the country as well. Uh, in Ontario, we're uh, primarily tied to the US automotive industry as a major income, and that, as you may have heard, is not going so hot. Uh, and then we have a huge rural population. 25% uh, of Canada is rural. We have massive, massive gaps. These red dots all over here, those are people who are up to uh, 500 kilometers away from specialist care. And there's a lot of dots. Uh, so our rural challenges are huge. Um, this is me getting to the airport a couple days ago. Um, <laughs> it's our summer, so the ice is a bit thin. You get nervous, but uh, I made it in time. No, this was actually Christmas Eve, uh, New Year's Day. I worked in a merch shift, and we went out and did some dog sledding a couple years ago. Uh, so all of these challenges mean we've got change ahead, and big change, the type of changes that Helen would say is sort of second, second level change, second order change, and that's what we have to undertake to have a workforce system uh, that's ready uh, to meet these types of dangers that I've outlined. Uh, but the problem is, and I sort of, I'm going to paraphrase Einstein here, but uh, I'll get it pretty close, we can't use the same thinking that created the problems to find the answers. And so we really had to take on and approach things differently. All right, so a quick pause um, for a personal moment. Uh, we're all fortunate to have heroes in our life. Uh, not just mentors, not just people we love and care about, but heroes. And, and my hero is my grandfather. And uh, I could take the rest of my hour and a half that I've been allotted to tell you about him. And uh, that makes you nervous, doesn't it? I know it's only 40 minutes. Um, and, uh, but uh, one of his many gifts to me was an interest in, in art. And so the rest of the show is going to be about art and art history. And if anybody can give me the names of all of the artists, uh, I will buy you dinner tonight. Uh, but it can't be a collective. It can't be like, as a community, you got them right. I take you all out to dinner. This has to be one. And Dr. Bevan is too smart. She doesn't get to play. All right, who does this? Dale Chihuly, that is right. And this is Dale Chihuly at work in his studio. And to make the types of pieces that you see here, he may have 50 people. He'll have five people, six people just doing colors. He'll have three to four people in full Kevlar outfits to be able to get these into the cool down unit when they're done. 
He'll have seven or eight people uh, just preparing bits, what they call bits, to add on to these things. And he works at about 3,500 to 3,800 degrees in a very fine window. If it gets too cold, it breaks and shatters. If it gets too hot, uh, it turns into a liquid and slumps. And you can go to your jam uh, studios just down the street on North Terrace there and see some beautiful examples of this being done, not on this scale. But what he does to do this is he works as a team. And one of the most important transformations that we've been bringing into our healthcare workforce is the ability to work as a team. We have anesthesia care teams, mental health care teams, cleft palate care teams, cardio surgery, cardiovascular surgery care teams. Uh, family health team who really moved huge portions of our primary care into a team-based model. We know the outcomes show better patient satisfaction, better safety, better provider satisfaction, and better health outcomes. But doing this is huge cultural change. It takes tremendous, tremendous careful effort to get there. So who, this is, a, I sort of like to get myself off the dinner hook early. Uh, so who's this on the very left? So it's Mansur, 14th century, first anatomical design uh, ever. This was the anatomy book. And eventually, over hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes illegal dissections, change in technology, everything else, we end up with uh, any clinicians in the room? Who's this? Who did this drawing? Any clinicians? Netter. It may not be as big in Australia, but basically anywhere in North America, Netter's anatomy is sort of the go-to picture. And now you can get it on your app, Netter by, on iPhone. And this didn't happen from the left over, where he basically thinks the whole body is just five humors, and that was all they had, into this level of detail in five years, or 10 years, or 100 years, but hundreds of years, 14th century to a few weeks or a year ago. And so, as much as we talk about incremental change, we've also had to sometimes go slow, and, uh, or transformational change, we've sometimes had to go slow and take incremental change. We have had massive primary care reform, really changed a lot of things about our primary care, but it took us about 15 years to get there, of just slowly tweaking and evolving the model to be able to get to where we are today. So some things are transformational, but a lot of what we've achieved today has been through very incremental change, and, and, and there's a need for a balance uh, in doing that. And I can give other examples, but primary care, again, just tweaking it. And we first, we call them family health networks. Then we call them family health groups. Then we call them family health teams, right? And we just kept adding and changing and morphing in order to get the types of buy-ins, the measurements and the outcomes that we wanted, we had to go very incrementally 10, 15 years uh, to land where we are now, and I'm sure we will continue to tweak it. So sometimes it's about transformation, sometimes it's about incrementalism, and primary care is a good example. This is a buddy of mine, he's about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, this is the spring breakup of the ice, and you get a sense of just how large some of those uh, ice shards are. So, uh, this is not a picture, this is Madrid's Royal Academy, um, and uh, established by decree in 1744, a bunch of famous artists, including a guy named Picasso, uh, went and studied there. And studying is important, you can't talk about a health workforce evolution or revolution or transformation without talking about education and learning. And we have basically, in the last five or six years, actually I would say about nine years, had to completely restructure our educational system. Who we brought in, where we train them, and how we train them. We use technology now to, keep, to create completely decentralized models of, of education. So we will have students spread across hundreds of kilometers linked into one classroom through technology in the University of British Columbia. We opened a Northern Ontario Medical School, which takes 91% Northern and rural uh, students into the class, and they basically spend their entire four years in small towns and on Aboriginal reserves. Their GPA at time of entrance is equal or higher to any other medical school in Canada, and the first charter class had their top mark out of all the medical schools in Canada on clinical skills and the top four for overall national exam marks, but fundamentally trained in a different way, in a different curriculum, uh, through a network model, we're using simulation. So we have had to rapidly expand our workforce. We have doubled, tripled, quadrupled the numbers of midwives, nurse practitioners, lab techs, MRI techs. We've quadrupled five times, six times, seven times up in some cases, because the numbers to start with were small. But we've had to do the education in fundamentally new ways to get them ready for the type of societal needs we are out there. So education has been, it's not just about more, it's about different. 
very important artist. He, he's rashly, so you've got an amazing exhibit on today. I went to the Saatchi exhibit. How many people have gone? I think you only have like another three days to go or something. They threatened me. I was like, it's okay, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm here today. But they were like, this day is the last day or something. So who's this? This is not in there, but he's referenced. He's part of the Saatchi collection. Dan Flavin. And Dan Flavin's credited with one of being one of the first people to bring in technology into art and art and technology and bridging that world. And we are increasingly using technology to drive, as I mentioned, our educational system, but also our practice uh, system. So just in Ontario, uh, we have something called Ontario Telemedicine Network. This year alone, we're going to have 3,000 healthcare providers in more than 1,175 sites use distance clinical care. We will have over 135,000 patient visits occur online. And these aren't just sort of carefully prearranged things. This is telestroke, telecritical care, teleburn, teletrauma, crisis telepsychiatry. So we have moved huge sections of our clinical care service into literally well over 1,100 sites across the province into virtual clinical care models. I was working in a merge once and I had a head CT that I had to do. And I took a look and I was pretty confident, but I wanted to make sure I, I was a bit worried about this patient. So I did what every eMERGE doc hates to do. And, and you sort of, you just grimace when you say it. You say, can you wake up the radiologist? They don't like to get up. So they said, yeah, yeah. So the nurse calls and I said, hi, I'm really sorry. And the guy was chipper, right? The guy was chipper. He says, oh, no, I see the patient. You know, no, no problem. I see it. Yeah, it's totally normal. Don't worry about it. I see what you see. But that's a variation of genetic abnormality. It's totally fine. So I hung up the phone. And, I said, boy, you know, that's the happiest radiologist at 3 in the morning I've ever, ever chatted with. And he said, well, he should be. He's on his patio in Venice. <laughs> so here I was in this rural community, town of four or 5,000, and this radiologist had married a supermodel, life is hard, who got bored of living in a town of 3,000 in on rural Ontario, which was surprising to me, but it happens, and they moved to Venice instead where she could pick up her previous lifestyle. And so he just went over there, and uh, he's an Ontario physician, licensed and everything. And when it, we're sleeping, he's up reading all the MRI scans and backing up the eMERGE doc. And we wake up, all the scans have been read. All right, who did these? Damien Hurst. That's why, she, A, I knew she'd get it. B, I can't afford the restaurants in England. Our, our dollar is very weak to the pound. Um, so Damien Hurst. So first of all, uh, two different pieces by him. What's interesting about Damien Hirst is this guy is a multi-millionaire. He's one of the first artists to make well over a million while still alive. I mean, this guy does well. These dot paintings do extremely well. This shark, one of the most famous pieces, sold for $8 million to some guy, a uh, New York investment banker. So he's the artist, right? This is his work. This is this is Damien Hirst's famous, famous artwork, right? This is him. Who caught the shark? Australian fisherman. Not Damien Hirst. One of your folks, not one of Helen's folks. Who built the tank? Who filled it with formaldehyde? Who put thousands and thousands of needles in this giant old abandoned Air Force base someplace in the UK and built this thing? Not Damien Hirst. Okay, fair enough. Who painted those dots? These are famous dot paintings. They sell for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars a piece, and he makes a lot of them. Does he sit down and paint it? Absolutely not. He does not. He picks the color schemes and the size of the dots, and then he has other people using household paints, by the way, not the fancy Lewis Craft stuff, household paints, and they produce this. And what I like about that is it tells us about how we have to think differently about our workforce. It can't just be about the doctor playing the doctor role, because only the doctor can do what the doctor does. And it can't be the nurse doing only what the nurse does, because nobody else can do it. It's about new roles, expanded scope. So and again, the UK has done great leadership here. But we've got physician assistants, nurse endoscopists, RN surgical first assist, clinical specialist radiation therapist, dental hygienists who can go out into rural and northern areas and, do, and, and, and work without the direct oversight of a dentist. We have changed and introduced new roles and given new providers roles in the system and really made a much more robust workforce to meet local, uh, local needs. And all carefully done for patient safety and protection, often regulated. Uh, but what we've done is we've been able to redefine the workforce just as Damien Hurst has redefined the artist. Dale Chihuly, remember at the beginning I showed you the picture? Some of you may have noticed he has an eye patch. 
He didn't lose it glass blowing. He lost it in a car accident. He has not picked up a tool and blown glass in probably a decade now, maybe longer. But he is still the best known art glass artist in the world. And those are all his pieces. But his role as artist has completely changed since his loss of his vision. And so we need to be able to constantly evolve and change. So 20 minutes left. So I've got two more slides. I'm going to skip a couple. I often think our healthcare system looks like this to our patients. Ominous, convoluted, threatening, unclear, tortuous. And I think that must be what it likes to feels to our patients. And so what we've introduced in a lot of parts of our healthcare system, but not all, are patient navigators, people to help guide the patients through. And their patient outcomes are improved, the satisfaction is improved, and our outcomes and our wait times, and our wait times in particular, are radically improved. And in many cases, these are clerks. In some cases, they're nurses or trained healthcare providers. In a lot of cases, they're clerks. And they, but they have been transformative in a lot of parts of our healthcare system. So I want to go fast, because there's a couple key things that I want to talk about. Uh, all right, you're going to have to give me five extra minutes. I apologize. But we'll get there. So who's this piece? This is an in important piece. Marcel Duchamp. I know you think it's our mud. And it's 1915, 1917. And in 2004, 500 European art historians said and voted, 500, this was the most important piece of work in the previous century. And we won't talk about why, but it was the most important piece of work. This was transformational. Everything else that you go down and see at Saatchi came out of this piece of work. And so again, this gets into our need to create the bandwidth for transformation, to develop the leadership for transformation. This is transformational piece. And we won't talk about why it turned the art world on its head. He was the exhibitor of the, nat he was the world's greatest artist at the time. And he was the curator of the French exhibit. Um, but he actually was so embarrassed, like nervous about his radicalness, he didn't sign his own name. But he won the exhibit in France in 1917. And so we need the ability to create the fountain, which is what this is called. We need the ability to foster innovation. So two things we're not doing well, and I'm only going to have time to talk about one of them. So I'm going to talk about the one thing that we don't do well in our healthcare workforce planning, the one thing that we are seriously lacking on. And that is recognizing the patient as the critical part of our health workforce. So this is Yoyo Kasuma. She's Japan's most famous artist. There actually was a great exhibit in Sydney about two years ago that I happened to catch. And this is called A Happening. And I want to read you from the famous art historian book called Wikipedia, what A Happening is. A happening is a performance, event, or situation meant to be considered as art. Happenings take place anywhere from basements to studio lofts and even street alleyways. They are multidisciplinary with a nonlinear narrative and the active participation of the audience. Elements are planned, but the artists retain room for improvisation. The new media art happenings eliminates the boundary between the artwork and its viewer. Henceforth, the interactions between the audience and the artwork makes the audience, in a sense, part of the art. Let me change it. Let me just tweak that Wikipedia for you. Listen carefully. A happening is a performance, event, or situation meant to be considered part of the healthcare experience. Happenings can take place anywhere, from hospitals to primary care clinics, even street alleyways of the home. They are multidisciplinary, with the active participation of the patient. Key elements of the happenings are planned, but healthcare <coughs> providers retain room for improvisation. This new healthcare experience eliminates the boundary between the provider and the patient. Henceforth, the interactions between the patients and the healthcare make the patient, in a sense, part of the healthcare experience. Until we can get our patients to be part of our workforce, part of their healthcare experience, and we eliminate this boundary, we will not have a sustainable workforce or a sustainable healthcare system. And the reality is, whether we like it or not, our patients are there. Our patients are already there. These are just a few of the things that are on the site. If you go and you take a look at Adelaide Healthcare Australia, 14,900,000 hits. Adelaide Healthcare blogs, 3,940,000. Almost all of those will be patient engaged and patient and consumer led. Australia Diabetes on YouTube, 1,160 YouTube videos alone. 
Our patients are there. I talked about Dan Flavin and technology. That was technology on our terms. That was doctor-mediated, nurse-led technology that we put in. This is patient-led technology. And it is time that we catch up, because when we catch up, we can bring them in, and our healthcare system becomes their healthcare system, and their healthcare system becomes our healthcare system, and we have a better future. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.